Hi everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time to watch my talk. Today I'll be reporting on two complementary experiments conducted as part of my PhD project. My thesis and the experiments supporting it explore the acoustics of napping in the early Paleolithic. I, and many researchers around the world, some of whom are also presenting here, see lithics as an indispensable resource for understanding and exploring the behaviours, cultures and minds of ancient peoples. We have over 3.3 million years of technology to look at and dozens of approaches, chain of repertoire, useware, residue analysis, experiments looking at language and social transmission. This experiment is part of an even smaller niche in lithic analysis that explores the role of sound in tool making. The ancient hominin soundscape was one filled with the noise of stone hitting stone. Exactly what characterized this noise and the relationships hominins had with that noise is largely underappreciated, with maybe half a dozen papers directly exploring it. This paper represents a new contribution to this area, helping to quantify the ancient lithic soundscape, providing some insights into the ways this soundscape was perceived and used. Any nappers in the audience would be keenly aware of the different kinds of noise trying to fracture stone makes. As a drummer with a penchant for stone tool making, I was fascinated by the ways good hits produced a visceral positive reaction in napping circles. The ways good nodules rung like a bell, the dull thud that emerged from poor quality raw materials. Here, I explored the acoustic properties of three very different raw materials, and the way the sounds they produce vary depending on whether or not a flake is produced by a strike. Flint represents a high quality raw material, producing the characteristic thin, sharp flakes associated with high quality tools. The flint was not available to early African hominins, comparable materials were and were preferentially chosen by them. Granitic gneiss is a less commonly used material, but it can still be fractured and produces flakes with clear diagnostic properties such as visible bulb percussion and sharp tapered tips. It and materials like it were used across the Paleolithic. Gabbro, coarse grained, extremely hard volcanic rock, represents a material unsuitable for mapping. It's extremely resistant to fracture, breaking my favorite hammerstone, and produces small, thick chunks upon fracture. This material and other granular, difficult to fracture rocks tend to be ignored by nappers. Each strike was in recorded individually, creating 1487 separate audio files representing 100 strikes of five chords of each material. A simple migrating platform technique was used, exploiting platforms generated by successive strikes to produce basic flakes. The recordings are then analysed in R using the SoundGen library. We extracted loudness, self-explanatory, dominant frequency, the strongest signal, the one that characterises the pitch produced, spectral centroid, strong element overtone, elements of timbre that add a unique character to a sound, and venar amplitude. Measure of signal to noise ratio between 0 and 1, where 0 represents a poor tone and 1 total white noise. Perceptually, it correlates to the clarity of the sound. Groups were then compared using non parametric tests, Crystal Wallace and Duns. After conducting the acoustic analysis, a representative sample consisting of 60 of the sound files was formed into a preference test for 85 participants. These were recruited through the prolific crowdsourcing platform, with the test taking place at the Gorilla experiment delivery platform. Each participant was represented with a sample, asked to listen and then respond to two questions formulated to be answered via a five-point Likert scale. First was, I like this sound. The second, this sound grabbed my attention. Statistical analysis was done through ordinal logistic regression models in R, using mainly functions in the ordinal package. No specific demographic information was requested, but it is fair to assume they were not familiar with stone tool making. Across both experiments, we predicted that flint would be extremely distinctive in sound, and that successful sound strikes would sound distinct within each material. Furthermore, we predicted that listeners would prefer the sounds of successful flint strikes and rate the poor quality materials much lower. Flint strikes would be rated as most attention grabbing, with failed strikes and strikes on poor materials rated as less attention grabbing. In the next slide, I'm going to clarify some of the terms used in the acoustic analysis. Sound, unless it's a computer-generated sine wave, is a constellation of different frequencies resulting from the unique composition of the resonant object and the stimulus that produces sound from it. In our case, this is rocks and hammerstones. For the purpose of this paper, we will discuss mainly low to upper mid-range frequencies and their relationships to the higher frequencies in the presence and brilliance range. This is what the rocks produced. Modern humans are most sensitive to sounds between roughly 2 to 5 kilohertz, having begun to shift away from a more ape-like conformation, more sensitive to lower frequencies, during the early Paleolithic. 
To understand the results we're about to discuss, it's important to understand the ways that objective properties such as frequency influence subjective experiences and auditory perception. Some key concepts are presence, brightness, tinniness, muddiness, wackiness. Frequencies in the presence range concur occurring with other frequencies in a sound produce a sense of closeness. Brightness is a combination of frequencies occurring to this in the 6 kHz plus range, harmonizing in the upper mid-range to produce a tone that sounds sparkly. Tinniness occurs when mid-range and lower mid-range frequencies are absent and the sound is overwhelmingly high-pitched. Conversely, muddiness is a mix of low-frequency sounds with little presence, creating a dull, messy sound. Thwackiness occurs when easier, percussive sounds also have strong signals in the upper frequency range. These high frequencies interact with other lower frequencies to produce a greater sense of weight and impact to the sound. Here are the results from experiment one, the acoustic analysis of strikes on three raw materials. Firstly, we see that flint strikes tend to be louder, higher pitched in both dominant and spectral centroid frequency and very clear, approaching a pure tone. Overall, this is in stark contrast to the other two materials. Here, we will focus on differences between materials before exploring the variation that exists between successful and unsuccessful strikes. Previous work by De Forest and Le Mans in 2022 showed that higher quality nodules among the same raw material tend to be louder. This is mirrored here between the different materials. Flint is much louder than the two poor materials and striking a granitic gneiss with sufficient force and angled correctly to initiate fracture produces a louder sound with greater clarity compared to other categories. Additionally, flint is much higher pitched, far above the median seen in the granitic gneiss with the gabbro. Granite and gabbro do not differ at all in the dominant frequencies produced during percussion. However, oddly, their spectral centroid frequencies do. Therefore, granite and gabbro are distinct in their overall timbre, if not in the dominant frequencies that tend to be produced. Finally, strikes on flint are far clearer, roughly 10 times that of gabbro, and far clearer still than the granitic gneiss. Here is a breakdown of statistical comparisons demonstrating differences between each material. Here we see that in terms of loudness and dominant frequency, gabbro and granitic gneiss differ very little. However, in terms of clarity and spectral, spectral centroid frequency, they do. Differences between flint and the other two materials are particularly stark. Overall, each material is quite distinctive. In the next slide, we will explore differences between flake producing and non flake producing strikes, where further differences between material can be seen. Here we see in flint, flake producing strikes are higher pitched dominant frequency and spectral centroid frequency. However, only minor differences exist in terms of loudness and clarity. Therefore, percussing flint tends to produce louder, clearer sounds than other materials, regardless of freight production, but the pitch is strongly influenced by whether or not a strike was directed with the precision required to initiate fracture. Higher pitches are produced by fleet producing strikes. Directly contrary to this, granitic gneiss shows no significant differences in the frequencies produced by percussion, but flake producing strikes are louder and clearer. This likely reflects differences in chemical and structural composition of this material in comparison to flint. Finally, the poorest material, gabbro, showed no differences among any of the acoustic properties except for spectral centroid frequency. This frequency was significantly higher among the successful strikes. Thus, the characteristic of successful strikes in this material is a somewhat more present and thwacky sound. Now that we've established the kinds of properties flake producing and non-flake producing strikes on different materials possess, we can explore the ways in which our participants responded to these strikes. This analysis was done using ordinal logistic regression, which gives odd ratios indicating the degree to which a variable influenced a respondent to increase their rating of a stimulus up the scale. So, numbers above 1 indicate a likelihood to agree more with the statement, whilst those below indicate a likelihood to disagree more with the statement. First, whether a strike produced a flake influenced participants strongly. 
Aesthetically, flake-producing strikes tended not to be rated as highly. However, the opposite is true for how salient a strike was. Successful strikes were likely to lead to more agreement by a factor of 4.34, extremely strong influence. Among materials, flint is the reference value, so when compared to flint strikes, listening to strikes on granite or gabbro tended to lead to greater agreement with the statements. This is true for both questions, thus suggesting that together, flake and fl non-flake producing strikes on flint weren't perceived as particularly aesthetically pleasing or particularly attention grabbing compared to other materials. Overall, when all strikes were taken together, granite comes out as the most aesthetically pleasing and most attention grabbing. However, this changes significantly when success status is added as an interaction variable. Successful strikes on flint are much more attention grabbing than successful strikes in other materials, suggesting that listeners are rating the significantly clearer and higher pitched sounds of successful flint strikes as most attention grabbing, but are not enjoying them compared to lower pitched sounds and still fairly low entropy sounds of granite or the muddier sound of gabbro. Now we've gone over the results of these two experiences. We can bring it together to form some ideas about how the lithic soundscape was perceived. From these two experiments, we learned that 1. Successful strikes on flint produce clear tones with dominant frequencies in the upper mid-range and spectral centroid frequencies in the upper part of the frequency spectrum, in the presence range. Perceptually, they are loud, clear, and bright. 2. Successful strikes on granite do not differ much from failed ones in dominance frequency or spectral centroid. They tend to cluster in the middle to upper middle of the frequency spectrum. Flake producing strikes are significantly clearer and louder, so overall a flake producing strike on ground compared to flint is lower pitched and punchier. 3. Gabbro produced a quieter, significantly muddier sound with little to distinguish good from bad hits except for a slightly more presence among flake producing strikes. Thus, materials are distinct from one another in the sounds they produce and can be seen as reflecting more raw material qualities. Flint is a crypto-crystalline material that fractures easily when kinetic force is applied at the correct angle, produces loud, clear sounds at high pitches. Comparatively, the coarse-grained gabbro does not transmit kinetic energy coherently enough to fracture reliably or produce strong, clear tones. In the middle of this is granitic gneiss. The participants in the preference test indicated an aesthetic preference for granite and viewed successful flint strikes as most attention grabbing. The higher pitched tones of successful flint strikes would certainly cut through an audio scene. However, given the paucity of flint lithophones in the archaeological record and the relative abundance of those made of granitic gneiss, particularly in Africa, it makes sense that our listeners preferred these less harsh sounds. As a napper, it was surprising to see flint strikes perform so poorly, aesthetically speaking. However, our responses to sounds are in large part affected by culture. These participants have no contact with these sounds and no prior familiarity with them. Thus, a high-pitched noise on its own is much more likely to be rated as less aesthetically pleasing than a lower-pitched, more thwacky noise, given broad cultural preference for bassy, percussive sounds in music. Bass sounds are increasingly prevalent in music as technology allows us to maintain those satisfying low-pitched sounds that induce us to dance so effectively, whilst maintaining overall clarity. It appears to our participants that granitic nice possesses those qualities, and that without the association between the sound and the satisfaction of creating a flake, the high-pitched tone of flint strike is more akin to the irritating tones of a fire alarm with a dying battery. There's a lot more to do in this area, and a lot more that could be added to this experiment. For instance, do the preferences of nappers and non-nappers differ? Though, of course, it's a lot harder to find nappers nowadays compared to the Paleolithic. My current research looks at the effects of access to acoustic feedback of novice nappers alone and in groups. I look forward to presenting the results of that research maybe next year. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the conference.